All right, uh, we've uh, taken about a month and a half or so, and we've focused a lot on uh, apologetics. Why? Because what we've said is that the, the biblical message, now that we're getting to the New Testament, uh, it's so wonderful. It's so earth-shattering. It changes uh, eternal destinies. It's so, so magnificent that we better know that it's true. And so we've looked at uh, reasons to believe that uh, this scripture is that the scriptures that the first century Christians had. We looked at supposed problems with uh, timelines and genealogies and in, in history, and we've, we've taken a look at all of that. And uh, today's message is called the Son of God, and we're going to be in Matthew chapter 3. And I want to start by, by setting, uh, laying down the setting once again. So everybody... Uh, it, it may be difficult with all that cold and ice, but I want you to imagine that you're somewhere in the Mediterranean this morning, uh, about 2,000 years ago. Imagine you're a first century Christian. It's very likely you're Jewish. You may have heard the message of Jesus Christ from Peter. Remember, uh, maybe you were one of the thousands of people that had gathered in at Jerusalem at Pentecost, and you came to faith in Jesus Christ after hearing the apostles talk about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Or maybe you were a Gentile living in Athens or one of the other uh, Greek cities and heard Paul speak with the creator of the world. The creator of the world who came in human form and he died for our sins and then rose again from the dead. It's probably early in the morning we have non-biblical source that tells us that the Christians met daily before sunrise. The church, maybe you're in a church or maybe you're out in nature somewhere, the church is a room in the home of a wealthy believer. It's a larger room so you can fit more people in. The place is packed with Jews and Gentiles. Some are rich, but mostly those who are jammed in there are poor. Many are slaves. Some people are city officials. Some are scholars or simple farmers. But again, many of them uh, are going to leave this and go to serve as slaves in, in some a job or another. But all in that room or in that grove or next to the river, all those who gathered, their family, brothers, sisters, they're united. They're sitting together, laughing together. Acts tells us they were eating together daily. They're eating together. They're sharing their lives together. The, the Bible tells us to, to rejoice with one another and to weep with one another. So people that would not have been connected from different layers of society, and it's much more than the United States today, but there was these different layers in this large class of people, there's slaves all at the bottom, they would not have been together. But in the church, they sit next to one another as brothers and sisters because they're united by Jesus Christ. Maybe the Maybe in this particular congregation, the men sit on one side, the women and the children are sitting on the other side. It's dark, but the sun's rising, gradually bringing a little more light. You and the other believers, again, you meet together often, sometimes outdoors, sometimes in a beautiful spot in nature. You don't meet just once a week to pray and sing, but several times a week, whenever you can. Not because you have to, but you're eager to be with God's people. You're just so excited to get together and to sing and to, and to reflect on the goodness of God every chance you get. And there's a, a spirit of joy in thanksgiving. Usually, someone reads a passage from the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures that the Jewish scholars in Alexandria completed about 130 years before Christ was born. Uh, this version of scriptures is the one that Matthew quotes from himself. The pastors share a message from this text and relate a story they heard about Jesus, and they teach a fulfillment of ancient. Uh, they teach Christ as a fulfillment of ancient prophecy. And again, because there is no New Testament yet, the original Christians were studying from the Old Testament. Life is hard in the first century. You work long hours. Uh, Forty hours would be an easy week. There is little in the way of free time or creature comforts. You probably married and started having children young because lifespans are generally very short. There's cruelty. 
There's no idea of human rights. Selfishness, power. Who has more wealth? These things are what drive society. But inside the church, it's different. There's hope. There's peace. There's joy. Every time the Christians gather, there's a sense of wonder. But the feeling of excitement is greater today. You've heard that the Apostle Matthew had completed a book containing his first-hand witness of Jesus and other information that he gathered from Jesus' mother Mary and his brothers. And last night, a hand Written, you're imagining this. Last night, a handwritten copy of the textbook came in, and the pastor has spent all night enthusiastically going over it. The word went out to the entire church, and now your church is about to hear the words of the Gospel of Matthew for the very first time. See, we get tired of this, or we, we go over it so quickly sometimes, we fail to realize how earth-shattering this book must have been, how, how amazing it would have been to be in there and hear Matthew's gospel just came in and they read it for the first time you're hearing this message your heart is pounding the pastor gets up he smiles he prays he begins to read he starts off a record of the genealogy of jesus christ son of david son of abraham for a jewish christian this tells us right off the bat where christ fits into god's big plan there's this timeline and, and god and jesus christ coming is a part of of this timeline that god's been putting together if you're a gentile believer you've heard and the longer you've been around the more you've heard these names like abraham and david they're familiar and now that christ is your savior you feel connected to these ancient jewish names these ancient jewish people in a way that greeks and romans who don't know the lord just can't you're not looking at Jewish history from the outside. You're sitting in there and you're hearing this. The genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. And you're connected. You connect to them because you're part of that same story that God's been telling throughout history. As a pastor continues to read the words of Matthew's book, you hear that Jesus was born to poor parents in humble circumstances. Totally in contrast with, with the will to power, the will to fame, the will to wealth that's driving the culture at large. Jesus was born, it started right at the very beginning. Jesus was born to poor parents in humble circumstances. You're introduced to the Holy Spirit right in chapter 1. Okay, so there's no chapters, right? There's no chapter and verses at this time. But right away, right at the beginning, we are introduced to the Holy Spirit because we can see the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament just like we can see Christ in the Old Testament. Remember when we were going through it slowly, we were drawing this out. But right here, right now, the church needs to know about the Holy Spirit. So it's introduced right away. You listen as the pastor reads that the Messiah was given the name Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. Now we hear that phrase, we're God's people, we're God's people. But you're sitting in that church. God calls me his people. Imagine as you read that. These are the words of the man, Matthew, the tax collector, who had been with Jesus, who had his life transformed. And he's saying, his name is going to be Jesus because he's going to save his, the people who belong to him. It doesn't matter if you're a city official. It doesn't matter if you're a slave. You belong to the Lord now. He would save his people from their sins, from themselves from their nasty attitudes, their hard-headedness, their pride, their lust, their greed, all of these things that wage war inside of us, Christ is going to save us from those things. And with gratitude, the thought comes to you, I'm one of his people. Don't you think that maybe we're reading Matthew too quickly sometimes? I'm one of his people. And then the pastor reads that Jesus was given the title, Emmanuel, God with us and with a fierce love and determination that wells up in your heart because you know it doesn't matter if you're bringing produce in from the countryside and the prices aren't good this week it doesn't matter if you've got a hard taskmaster you've got to get back soon and it's going to be a difficult day because you know whatever you're going to face health wise financially emotionally relationally you're not going to face it alone because Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And you're sitting in this room hearing these great things from the text 
of a man who had spent, it was an apostle who had spent all these t- this time with Jesus Christ. As the pastor reads, you realize how wondrous it is that the greatest king of all, he came with so much humility. And that's kind of a theme of these first three chapters. God, who, can, who demands our worship, is also the most humble. Now, in the world, you have the police, you have teachers, you have government officials, and we Christians are called to humble ourselves to leadership. And, we, and, we're, and even non-Christians, they know that humility, well, they often demand humility. It's seen as a virtue. And sometimes you'll have a really good king who is also humble. But God doesn't share his glory with anybody. And God, who is the greatest, is also the most humble of all. And you're sitting in this room and boom, 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 this message of God's humility. God who would condescend. People think it's amazing that you're saying God would come and he would have to take a bath and and God would have to go to the bathroom. That's ridiculous. God could never do. Well, just God saying, I love you, God speaking to us, God communicating to us is already astounding grace and astounding love. Why should God take any notice of us at all? And like we saw last week out of a a, a trillion galaxies with a trillion stars and, and our little dust ball of a planet, and all this rebellion and anger and hatred and bitterness, and God comes right into the middle of it. He's born as a little baby in meekness, gentleness. It's amazing. He came in humility in order to save his people and to serve them by saving them from their selves because the world's broken, you and I are broken, we're all messed up, and we need to be saved. Saving us from our sins. That nastiness inside of us that runs away from the will of God and said, I'm going to make my own choice. I'm going to do things my way. We shake our fist at God. And God comes in meekness and gentleness to save us. And that's where Matthew goes next with his book. He contrasts the humble Savior with the mighty King Herod, who would use all the power at his disposal, even going as far as having innocent toddlers killed. Imagine how low that is. Just to hold on to his throne a little longer. And secular history tells us that he was, he was paranoid. And he lived his life afraid of losing his grip on power. And and you could not have failed to notice the difference between the great king of kings and his humility to the world around, into the the family of of the Herods. The way God does things. And it would have been a challenge, whether whether you're a rich man in town or whether you're a slave, it would have been a challenge because all of us struggle with this pride inside. I'm not going to submit. I will not bow. I'll give God a part of my life. I'll just give him what I want to give. And meanwhile, he gives everything for us. And the contrast would have been very clear as you sat in that church. Fast forward now a couple decades as we begin chapter 3, and Matthew introduces the famous figure of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a man who would hold the intention of an entire nation. Religious and political leaders, as well as everyday people, paid close attention to everything that John said. He had the attention of everybody, and people were coming to John by the thousands. And you know what we're going to see about John? Incredibly humble. Incredibly humble. Uh, That's not like me. It's so easy to get bent out of shape. It's so easy to feel like we haven't been respected enough, that we've been wrong, that nobody paid attention, that we're all misunderstood. And here's God, and then John the Baptist, who Christ is, we're going to see, says nobody's been ever greater than him. And his hallmark is humility. John the Baptist is an amazing man. He's related to Jesus. He's coming, <clears throat> he's foretold in the Old Testament in Malachi. He's a prophet. A lot of times people say he's the last of the Old Testament prophets. Jesus uh, gives him this incredibly high praise. I'll read it for you now from Matthew 11. Uh, Jesus is speaking to a crowd of people. And uh, John the Baptist's followers had just come to Jesus and saying, Are you really the Messiah? Because, Because 
John the Baptist is in prison. He's languishing. And it was totally unfair. Life doesn't become fair because you follow Jesus. In this world, we have trouble because we live in a fallen world. We have trouble because of our messed up nastiness. And sometimes we're going to have even extra trouble. Congratulations, you're a Christian. Your family's not going to understand you. Congratulations, you're a Christian. Your workplace is not going to understand you. The school system is not going to understand you. Sometimes, not only we have the trouble that everybody has to face, we have the extra benefit of trouble only given to people who are trying to follow the Lord. But thank goodness, we're not alone. And we have a God who's with us in every circumstance. But John is, is languishing there in prison. He sends his followers. He says, I, I thought Jesus was the one, but what's going on? This doesn't make any sense. And they come and ask him, are you really the Messiah? And Jesus uh, says, you've seen prophecy fulfilled. You know. And, and then he turns. And Jesus is kind of hard. He said, blessed is the one who doesn't fall away on my account. Take that message back to him. But then he turns to the crowd. And there's a big group of people here. And speaking to the crowd, he says, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? Because John the Baptist's ministry was in the wilderness. He had to go out to, to hear him. Did you go out to see a reed shaken by the wind, just this flimsy little reed? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? He's a rough character, really rough clothes. Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. And then listen to what Christ says, Matthew 11:10. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, you will prepare your way be, uh, who will prepare your way before you. In other words, John the Baptist's mission was to prepare the people for the coming of Jesus Christ. Then Matthew 11:11, 11, 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, who is pretty much everybody, right? Uh, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. John the Baptist is not only mentioned in the Bible, but in several other religions as well, quite a few other religions. Uh, he's actually the main guy in one uh, false religion. But more importantly, the, uh, the ancient historian Flavius Josephus, we've, we've spoken about him quite a bit, records the following information about John. Quote, now some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army came from God and that it very justly as a and that very justly as a punishment of what he did against John that was called the Baptist for Herod slew him who was a good man and commanded the Jews to exercise virtue both as to righteousness towards one another and piety towards God and so to come to baptism and then uh, uh, Josephus repeats again so a lot of people thought that the Herod's army was destroyed because God was, was uh, punishing them for killing John the Baptist. Josephus also mentions that John had tremendous influence over people, that large crowds were following him. Uh, he mentions his imprisonment and he mentions his execution. Here's a secular source uh, verifying, thank you. I knew I didn't want vindicating because we don't need it vindicated by secular source, but verifying everything we see uh, in the scriptures here. Uh, Matthew not only introduces us to John the Baptist, but he also introduces us to two religious political parties that are going to play an important role in the life of Christ. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, and we're going to be hearing about these groups quite a bit. The Sadducees uh, were fewer in number uh, by far, but they were a majority in the Sanhedrin. They ran the Jewish ruling council, and they had more political party. They ruled and they maintained the temple and the priesthood, and they were connected to the rich and elite of their day. Uh, the Sadducees collected taxes, even from Jews who didn't live in the area. They, they collected taxes from wherever the diaspora, wherever the Jews were scattered. They conducted foreign affairs. They led the army, and they were judges in domestic affairs. So the Sadducees had a lot of clout. Politically, they had a lot of clout. The Sadducees believed in God but they thought that the soul died when the body died and that there was no afterlife. Uh, heaven was just where God was, and that's why they were sad, you see. Uh, it's an old joke, but it helps us, it helps us remember, right, uh, what they were like. <clears throat> you know, almost, and this is, this is a little oversimplified, but they were almost like the liberals, Christians of their day. They, they were going through the outward practice of religion, 
Uh, they believed in God. They, they were really big on law and order and those kind of things because they liked the political structure the way it was. They were in positions of authority. Uh, but they, they didn't have much uh, uh, in the way of God interacting with them. And they rejected the concept of angels, and they emphasized the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. The other group, the Pharisees, accused the Sadducees of loving the writings of Homer too much, which I thought was neat, and of being enamored with Greek culture. Uh, the Pharisees you can think of simply as maybe like the conservatives of their day. In return, the Sadducees, according to Flavius Josephus, said that, quote, the Pharisees have delivered uh, to the people a great many observances by succession from their fathers, which are not uh, written in the law of Moses. And for that reason, it is the Sadducees, and for, it, and for that reason, it is that the Sadducees reject them and say that they... Uh, that we are to esteem those observances to be obligatory, which are in the written word, but are not to observe, which are derived from the tradition of our forefathers. So basically he's saying that the Pharisees were, we had a lot of traditions uh, that passed down from generation to generation. They were trying to get all the people to obey those, and the Sadducees said, no, we're only supposed to be obedient to the law of Moses. <clears throat> so uh, the Sadducees accused the Pharisees of adding man-made rules that come from human traditions to the teaching of Scripture, and the Pharisees accuse the Sadducees of not believing in the resurrection. And interestingly, Jesus agreed with them both. <laughs> Jesus agreed with the Pharisees when it came to the reality of angels and the resurrection in heaven and hell, but he agreed with the Sadducees that the Pharisees were guilty of heaping man-made rules upon their disciples. And so that kind of made me think, wow, it's really easy to notice the faults of others, but it's hard to see our own faults. And meanwhile, God says, you guys are both messed up here, and God brought the, brought the truth that people needed to hear. Josephus further tells us that there were about 6,000 Pharisees at that time, and the people liked the Pharisees better than the Sadducees. And the, Sad, the Pharisees get a bad rap in our modern culture. You're, you're called a Pharisee if, if you are serious about the Word of God or something. But it's very significant that... The Bible tells us a significant number of Pharisees actually come to faith in Jesus Christ. I don't know if we have a record of significant numbers of Sadducees ever doing that. The rich, the elite, those who wanted to hold on to power. But the Pharisees had this benefit that they wanted to take the Scripture seriously. So even though they were off track, there was something there that God could work with. And God could bring them back and reel them in. So when people are talking bad about Pharisees, uh, we don't have to do that ourselves necessarily. We all know what it means, though. Uh, Matthew indicates that John the Baptist's message became so popular that even the Sadducees and the Pharisees are forced to come. They have to come to the Jordan River. They have to come out, and, and they have to listen to him wherever he's going because he has so much sway over the people. And, uh, and Josephus tells us that the Sadducees were afraid that John the Baptist could start a revolution because so many people were following him. Uh, if he wanted to change that from spiritual authority to political clout, he maybe would have been able to cause a lot of trouble for the nation. So they were going out to hear what he had to say. And uh, Josephus also talks about uh, uh, Herod marrying his brother, uh, Philip's wife, and all that that the Bible also speaks of. Uh, John's message, though, he's attracting all these people. There's nothing about John the Baptist's message that is sugary. There's nothing about it that is easy to hear. Like every other prophet in the scripture, he doesn't tickle people's ears with a message of health and prosperity. He had a strong message of impending judgment. He called upon people to turn from their sins and trust in God. And, and remember, we were talking about this in our neighborhood on Thursday night. We're living at a time in the United States when Christianity is dwindling. The number of churches is decreasing. The number of people who say they have nothing to do with faith in God is increasing. And what does, our, what does our culture tell us? What's a common thought in Christianity? Oh, you can't talk about fire and brimstone. It'll draw, drive people away. I've been reading a lot of, uh, of, uh, about the lives of missionaries from a couple different books now, uh, just recently, and, and, and their message and their story, and then looking in Scripture. We live in a culture where it says, don't talk about impending judgment because it will drive people away. By the way, the cultures where the Christians were having success at reaching their culture explain why we needed the cross. The wrath of God is being revealed on hev from heaven against all unrighteousness, and we need a Savior. We need to be saved. 
We need the cross because we're sinners. We're messed up and God will judge. And John the Baptist didn't give a nice, sweet, sugary message. He brought a challenge. We're sinners. We need to repent. And the wrath of God is coming. He called upon people to turn away from their self-will and turn towards the will of God to put their trust in the Lord. And as evidence of repentance, John was calling people to be baptized. The people listening to the reading of Matthew's book, remember we're imagining we're in that first group, would be very interested in this because right here at the beginning of the book, it's talking about baptism. And they too would have been baptized as a sign of their new faith in Christ. And Christ's first recorded words in the Gospel of Matthew. Now some people think that Mark was written first and then, and then Matthew took that as a core and expanded around it to give more of the story. It's also possible that maybe Matthew was written first and then uh, Mark was a short version of it to just get it to people and here, read this as fast. You can get it. It's a real succinct that way. But whatever, there was definitely collaboration there because there's, there's just a lot of copying back and forth. But, but you're sitting there and you're hearing this from Matthew the very first time. And you're thinking, I was baptized too. In the very first recorded words in the Gospel of Matthew, Christ's very first recorded words were about being baptized. And he said, let it be so now. Now Christ has spoken. Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And I'm sure the people sitting there, their hearts would have just been ablaze to think, I too have followed this example. I was baptized too in the name of the Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's, let's read along now together in uh, Matthew chapter 3. It's a short chapter. And again, I want you to, as I read, try to imagine yourself as this first century Christian hearing the Gospel of Matthew read for the very first time. Jesus appears as an adult now. The Bible says he was around 30. He was probably at least 30. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken through the prophet. So connecting him again to the Old Testament, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. He, he, uh, his food was locusts and wild honey, and there's some debate on what locust means here. There was a locust plant that's edible. Uh, probably it was the insect that he was eating, although if you were an Ebionite, which was kind of a first century Jewish cult, uh, they thought that Jesus and John the Baptist were all vegetarians, so... Uh, verse 5, people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and from the whole region of Jordan. So everybody's coming out. And they were confessing their sins. And this is another hallmark of getting close to Jesus. We get close to God, we get close to the light of the Lord, and we start to see our own hands are dirty. When we're far away from God, it's easy to justify every nasty attitude. It's easy to justify every sin. We get close to God, and we start to confess our sins because God reveals these things to us. So they're, they're coming to the region of Jordan. They're confessing their sins. They were being baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was being baptized, he said to them, Oh, it's so nice to see you. Let's have a picnic lunch after. No. You brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, well, I'm not saying we need to do the first part, you brood of vipers. But, but this idea, when, when we have faith in God, it doesn't mean uh, mental, I, a mentally assent, assent. I believe there's a God, yeah. I believe Jesus is God. Sure, everybody does, right? Did he die on the cross? That's what people tell me. I believe in that. And I sign my name and I'm saved. <laughs> Produce fruit, fruit in keeping with repentance. Because repentance means I'm changing from God's way, from my way to God's way. I'm saying that God's ways are better than my ways. They're higher than my ways. What does, again, we talk about this. This word faith sounds so religious nowadays. Faith. You have to have faith. And maybe I have to get this kind of feeling. I've got to work up a feeling. Oh, I have faith. I, it's almost not really a word that we can use anymore because it's so spiritualized. Let's just use the word trust. Do I trust God? Well, God says this is the way I want you to live. 
no, I'd rather do things my way. Then are you really, do you really have faith? Are we really trusting God? I say, God, your way is so beautiful and better than my ways. And I'm going to plant my flag here. This is the Lord's place. I'm going to plant my flag here. I'm going to die here. I'm standing on God's will. Yeah, we fall. That's what grace is for. That's what the cross is for. But I'm saying God's ways are better than my ways. I trust that. I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. In fact, the more I know myself, the more I know that his ways are a lot better than Dan Wolf's ways. But if I'm saying, I just want to sign my paper and then do my own thing, well, John the Baptist would say, have fruit in keeping with true repentance. Now, where were we? Oh, yeah, brood of vipers. Uh, you brood of vipers who were warned to flee from the coming wrath. Who, who warned you to flee from the coming, coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Or, or we're Americans or we're Christians. All, everybody's saved, right? I tell you that these stones, that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe, listen to this. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And this is, this is a fire and brimstone message. This is a serious warning from God. Repent, repent. Turn from yourself, turn to the living God. And we've got something better. And we can say, turn from yourself because God loved you so much. He went to the cross for you. And heaven's doors are wide open. But you're going to have to leave yourself behind and turn to the Lord. I baptize with water for repentance. But after me comes one more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. John the Baptist shifting the spotlight from himself. It's not all about him. It's all about the Lord. Uh, I can remember my Uncle Dan preaching a message on uh, who's in the spotlight. And John the Baptist was shifting the spotlight over to Jesus Christ. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He is, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And people say, oh, God the Father is scary, but Jesus is nice. No, we're talking about Jesus right here. Jesus Christ is fierce. He's a fierce warrior. And he also loves you. And he'd do anything for you. He went to the cross for you. He wants to carry you. He wants to pour out blessings on you. But don't forget who he is. In fact, if we remember who he is, it makes his love all the more amazing, doesn't it? This fierce, mighty warrior would go to the cross for me. Now it gets scary when he says, come and follow me. <laughs> Wait a second. Did he just go to the cross to love other people? What's he going to call me to do? What am I going to have to sacrifice if I'm going to truly follow this mighty warrior, this great king? Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, and with him... I am well pleased. God the Father praises his Son. And you're sitting in that room. All your sisters on one side, all the brothers on the one side. And you put your faith in Jesus Christ, and you're hearing this story of Christ's baptism. And at Christ's baptism, you see the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And out of heaven, God puts his mark. God says, this, he's mine. He's my son. And I'm very well pleased with him. We started, hearing, we started Matthew a couple weeks ago by hearing that Jesus was the long-promised Messiah. We saw his place in the history of Israel, how all history was pointing towards his birth, how it was proclaimed by an angel that Jesus would save his people from their sins, that people would call him God with us. The Holy Spirit is introduced. We see the wise men come from the east to honor him. Christ is uh, contrasted with Herod, the heavenly king, with the earthly dictator. We're introduced to John the Baptist. God the Father himself speaks out of heaven and tells us who Jesus is. 
And the Holy Spirit descends upon him. So right away we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together, the Trinity, right there in three chapters. In this message again and again and again, look at God has come humbly. God consented. He came along. He, he was baptized to give us this pattern. He was baptized to show us a path. John the Baptist said, I couldn't even undo his sandals, which was the job for the lowest slave. And here he comes and submits himself to baptism. And this is how the book of Matthew begins. I've never, ever, in all my years of studying Matthew, appreciated it this much as this time. This is absolutely gorgeous to me. I'm loving each moment of it uh, to hear these things. And this is God's proclamation. Who is Jesus? And what does it mean for us? And what's his example for us? This is how the book begins. I can't wait to read more, see what happens next. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for this amazing, amazing book. Uh, thank you, Lord, for preserving it so well throughout history so that we could get this eyewitness account and we can read it afresh, Lord God. We ask that your Holy Spirit would just work in our souls so that we don't get tired of reading something we've read so many times, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, that you would speak to us and we would see the example of your son Jesus, Lord, whom you love, and that we would want to be more like him. Father, give us strength, give us wisdom. Please help us to be loving and, and humble and patient and good. And Lord, I pray that just as John the Baptist spoke, spoke a strong message of repentance, that we could reach out to our culture with the cross of Jesus Christ and win many people to faith in you, Lord God. Please give us these opportunities and give us boldness when the time comes and the words to say. We pray all this, God, and we just thank you for loving us so much and just being who you are. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.